But his sit-down with Johnson was the first face-to-face -face meeting abroad of his presidency, a sign of the importance of the US-UK relationship, if not the Biden-Johnson relationship. Joe Biden having called Johnson a physical and emotional clone of Donald Trump as recently as 2019. But the leaders and their better halves were all smiles today, and Joe Biden, well, he's not Donald Trump. And that's kind of the point. He's not going to spew white nationalist rhetoric about refugees stripping Europe of its culture. Sad. He's not going to shake down NATO members for bigger financial con contributions like a lunchroom bully. He's not going to try and buy Greenland like it's one of his golf courses. Remember that? Did he actually think it's green? He's not going to be quick to blame terror attacks on Muslims and that and that. All of that is hugely reassuring. It is. 75% of people surveyed in 16 nations overseas by Pew Research believe in Joe Biden to do the right thing. For Donald Trump last year, that number was 17%. Ouch. So, on the one hand, yay, a non-racist, not crazy, actually informed person is once again representing America on the world stage. What a relief. But on the other hand, as gratifying as it is to have a grown-up in charge again, there are certain issues that remain American issues, problematic issues, no matter who is president, even when the difference is as stark as Biden versus Trump. Does the administration actually have a policy on Ukraine that's going to work because there are Russian troops massing on the western border, which could be a challenge to the US ahead of this sit-down, and there really isn't much leverage that the United States has, regardless of who our commander-in-chief is. What about a specific policy on free trade or the European Union or, you know, climate change? Because, okay, the US is back in the Paris Climate Agreement, but are the targets set by the Biden administration for cutting emissions over the coming decade, are they ambitious enough? Just being not Trump, just knowing the American president is unlikely to shove aside another NATO member in Brussels next week is a welcome improvement. But it's definitely not enough. There are a host of wider issues that bedevil the globe, some caused by America and some that need America's fixing. So what is Joe Biden going to do about all of that? For more, let's bring in President Biden's Deputy National Security Advisor, John Finer, live from the White House. Uh, John, thanks so much for joining us on what I'm sure is a very busy evening. Um, as part of President Biden's meeting with Prime Minister Johnson, the Atlantic Charter of 1941 between the US and UK is getting its first refresh in 80 years. Why now? What needed updating? Look, I think what needs updating uh, is the relationship between the United States and the UK after uh, four years in which uh, there was a challenge, and the challenge was caused uh, largely by our, our predecessors and by President Trump, and not just the relationship uh, with the UK, but as you indicated in, in your opening, where you very effectively, I think, uh, made at least some of uh, the case that we're going to be making on these meetings uh, overseas, the relationship with many of our partners and allies were under significant strain. I think we see this visit uh, by the president, his first overseas uh, travel, as an opportunity to kind of clear the decks, uh, to represent the United States on the world stage in a fundamentally different way than we have uh, over the last four years, uh, and to start uh, the process and continue the process that we've already had underway for the first few months of this administration of restoring our, our partnerships and our alliances, yeah. which is the cornerstone of everything we do in the world. You you mentioned that a lot of the problems were caused by your predecessor, Donald Trump, and I'm not going to disagree with you, John. But just to check, is the White House position that Boris Johnson is a physical and emotional clone of Donald Trump? Because that's what the president called him just 18 months ago. I can confirm for you that that is not the official White House position in this administration. I'm shocked to hear you say that. Um, President Putin has been flexing uh, Russia's military muscles ahead of next week's NATO summit. And President Biden has made a big play about standing up to Putin in a way that Donald Trump didn't. Have a listen to this clip from yesterday in England in front of the troops. I'm heading to the G7, then to the NATO ministerial, and then to meet with Mr. Putin to let him know what I want him to know. <laughs> I mean, John, it's a nice hawkish line. It gets cheers from the troops. But it's not as if you have a military solution to the crisis in Ukraine or Vladimir Putin's mistreatment of his opposition at home. How does that help diplomatic dialogue to make hawkish remarks in front of US troops stationed in Europe just days before a first meeting with Putin? Uh, Manny, look, uh, you're right that there is not a military solution to many of the problems uh, that the United States confronts uh, around the world. And frankly, that's not the way we're approaching our foreign relations. 
We have been very clear in this, in this administration that we are going to start with diplomacy, that that is the first and foremost uh, tool of executing our foreign policy, not as a favor or a concession uh, to our partners or to our adversaries, because that is the way we think can best advance American interests, including vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. We don't meet with Russia in spite of the fact that we've got real differences uh, with them, and you alluded to one, uh, Ukraine. There are many others, uh, from cybersecurity uh, to their human rights uh, violations. We meet with them because yes. of those differences, because that is the way that we see best uh, yes. fit to try to advance uh, how we see things. But, John, you don't have any leverage over Putin, or do you? Because you can ask him to release opposition leader Alexei Navalny from prison, but you can't make him, can you? Look, diplomacy is not about making countries uh, do things. We have, uh, this is a consequential relationship. The way the, the United States and Russia relate to each other has an impact on a whole range of events in the world. They have things that they have done to the United States. We have things that we have done in return. The president was very clear that we would hold Russia accountable and impose costs on Russia when they transgressed uh, certain boundaries. And we have acted upon that in this administration. And that continues to be the approach that we will take. We're not looking to escalate, but we're also not looking to tolerate things that they do that we find unacceptable. So for President Biden, this trip is about promoting democracy and standing up to autocracy, which is a laudable goal, one I hope we all share, especially in the wake of Donald Trump's love affair with authoritarianism. But John, does the United States have the credibility to lecture China and Russia on autocracy when it's closely allied, even under Joe Biden, with some pretty vicious dictatorships in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia and Egypt? You, you know, many, we don't see our approach as, as lecturing anybody. Not again, not our adversaries, not our friends, uh, not our partners. What we see our approach is doing is trying to prove a, a, a very important point, which is not the moral superiority of democracy over autocracy, although I think we would certainly feel comfortable making that case, but the superiority in terms of its ability to deliver for our people uh, and for people around the world. And I think what you saw today uh, and yesterday at the G7, this announcement of a billion uh, vaccines that are gonna be provided from the G7, from the world's leading democracies to the rest of the world, is proof positive that democracies can deliver. And the president's goal here is to demonstrate uh, I, delivery, uh, not to have a political science argument. I understand. No, I understand the delivery. I understand the political science. My point is, whether you use the word lecture or not, you made the point, you made the point you, you're happy to make the moral case for democracy. I'm saying, please do make it to China and Russia. But what is the point of only making it to China and Russia? Why not to our allies? You're not addressing the issue of Saudi Arabia and Egypt and UAE and Qatar, none of which are democracies, but we arm, we support. Uh, so uh, I, I would, I would uh, uh, profess to you that we do make this case. We do make this case to our partners and allies. We do in, in every conversation that we have uh, with our foreign counterparts. It is not just something that we talk about uh, with our adversaries. And uh, so I, I think the premise of the question is, is a bit off in the sense that we do uh, make this argument all the time and in, in every significant diplomatic conversation. Okay, I, I hope that's the case. Uh, the president today announced the donation of, as you mentioned, half a billion Pfizer vaccine doses abroad. And he talked about the risk of new mutations spreading with only half of Americans fully vaccinated. Uh, you're the deputy national security advisor. Would you say there is a national security threat to the U.S. here at home if we are unable to stop the pandemic abroad and help vaccinate the rest of the world? Absolutely. I think we stand by that 100 percent. I think if you looked at the, the strategic guidance that our National Security Council put out at the beginning of our administration, we talked about the threat of global health crises. We talked about pandemics as a national security threat. And we've also acted on that in one uh, interesting and important way. There was a part of the National Security Council, the part of the uh, White House that makes foreign policy that focuses on global health and health security. That was shut down under the previous administration. Those people that worked on those issues were sent back to their home agencies. We brought that work back into the White House, back into the National Security Council, because we genuinely believe that this is among the most important threats uh, that the country faces. And we need that expertise here. The damages from the pandemic are huge, but they pale in comparison to what the potential damages from the climate crisis are and will be going forward to both America and the entire planet. Do you believe America is now leading by example after the climate denialism of the Trump era? Can we say to the world we have the most ambitious climate goals and carbon emissions targets of any country in the industrialized world? We can't, can we? 
Look, Mehdi, I, I will not deny that our credibility on climate change as a nation took a very serious hit during the four years of the Trump administration, when you had an administration that not only uh, professed not really to believe in uh, the effects of, of man, uh, human-caused climate change, but actively worked uh, to subvert uh, climate goals. We are taking a fundamentally different approach to this issue, having rejoined uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and now having worked with our partners and allies uh, through a summit that the president hosted, through a commitment that we have made to increase uh, the ambition of our carbon emissions, uh, working towards the Glasgow summit at the end of the year. And I think you will see significant climate-related deliverables in the president's European conversations uh, as well, and some announcements I think will make uh, important steps forward. John Finer, I do hope that's the case, and I appreciate you taking time out tonight. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.